Welcome to this video on the guilds from the tabletop role-playing game, Mummy the Curse. Mummy the Curse is the Chronicles of Darkness successor to Mummy the Resurrection, but where the Shims Heru, or Amenti of Resurrection, were the closest thing that the old world of darkness could boast to having actual good guys, the Deathless are the weapons of a long-dead empire whose name is known only to themselves and the sorcerer priests of the nameless empire who created them. In exchange for immortality, the Arisen are bound to serve the Judges of Duat until the end of time, or they are released from the decree that binds them. Power, as all Arisen learn, is not without its cost. But without further ado, the guilds. The Ma Kep. Every civilization relies on its middle tier, those who are not the rulers or masters, but carry out their command and know enough to handle the more mundane tasks of rulers without being directed. In Irem, these talented servants and freemen were called the Ma Kep, the bearers of the engraved. They were the stone dressers who handled the work that was unworthy of the time of the master masons, and the slave drivers who made sure that the mundane, repetitive drudgery was completed in a timely fashion. The Ma Kep were the secondary line of laborers, the only members of Irem who did not make use of the Ma Kep were the scribes, who saw them as dirty, unread peasants whose grasps greatly exceeded their reach, that being the right hand of the guildmasters. But in time, the guildmasters of Irem assigned the best of the Ma Kep with another task, to keep their ears open for talk of treachery and rebellion. The Ma Kep were well suited to this. They were already expected to keep laborers and slaves on track either with rewards or punishments. It was a natural evolution for the Ma Kep to transform from trusted, attentive servants to secret police. They could go where their masters could not without notice and report what they had seen and heard, all in the course of their other work. In the days of Irem, the Ma Kep drew from the ranks of those who preferred a quiet reward and the continued prosperity of the empire to those who needed to be showered in honors. While the Ma Kep value obedience, a certain level of independence is necessary among those who watch to act in the interest of the masters, even if the masters did not direct them to do so. Sometimes, the best service that they could offer their masters was honest dissent. After all, the Ma Kep are servants, not sycophants. Sometimes, one must tell their master, privately, certain hard truths. The Ma Kep look at the modern world with a certain amount of pride and concern. While service seems to be a stated virtue of those who serve the rulers of the modern world, there is also an innate self-aggrandizement, a service that glorifies the servant rather than the empire, or rather, the nation and people. To the Ma Kep, the conqueror had both the right and duty to enslave the conquered, to give meaning and value to their lives in service to civilization, rather than leave them in barbaric degradation. As the Arisen, the Ma Kep are still observant and pragmatic. They keep watch on the other guilds, not because of the Shunyatu, the sorcerer priest, are watching, but because the sooner they know when someone cannot be trusted, the sooner that person can be dealt with. Rarely, the Ma Kep do that dealing themselves. That's for their superior to decide. Every person craves recognition and even praise for work well done, but the Ma Kep are chosen for their modesty. They derive satisfaction from their skill rather than from notice or honors. After all, notoriety only makes their task harder. They regard all, including themselves, as tools for the glory of the nameless empire. Likewise, honor among the Ma Kep is granted to those who set aside self-interest and vanity in favor of efficiency and discretion. This is not so that the Ma Kep can be the secret rulers of the Arisen, but so that others may act at their most efficient. Indeed, the Ma Kep shun glory as failure. The Ma Kep make use of the humble yet versatile and powerful amulet. While amulets may be used for showy displays of power, they are best used to take knowledge from one person and put it at the disposal of another. Amulets may be used to transmit all manner of information from technical data to geographic and even social information, how to fit in, or how to steal an aphorism from a much younger civilization to do in Rome as the Romans. The Ma Kep use these amulets to blend in with the current surroundings, to pass through the currents of time without so much as a ripple in the waves. 
Sometimes, this ability to adjust quickly to modernity causes the mock-up a certain amount of arrogance. It is easier for a burglar to rob those who allow them in the house than to attack locks and barred windows. Likewise, the mock-up would rather befriend their obstacle than cut them down. Indeed, it may be easier to restore them to the favor of the judges than to destroy them outright. So the mock-up played to their target's desires, prejudices, and fears, offering a solution to their problems while secluding their own motives. The singers and poets may love grand duels of fate between destined rivals, but to the mock-up such battles are a sign of inelegance. As the strategist Sun Tzu once posed, the greatest victory is winning a battle before it is ever even fought. The mock-up tend towards subterfuge and subtlety rather than shows of brute force. However, when faced with an enemy who cannot be ignored, they attack that enemy at its weakest points, rather than a valorous but doomed headlong charge. Some name this cowardice, but the mock-up are as willing to face death as any arisen. They are just less likely to attack head-on. Rather, they sacrifice their lives and souls when it will achieve the maximum good. The mock-up, by and large, consider apotheosis to be a distraction from their duties to the judges of Duat. According to the Songhai, the floating log never becomes a crocodile. Likewise, trying to escape from the escape from death seems churlish and unworthy of the arisen. The power of the mock-up is the use of amulets, some made of stone, others made of precious stone, or even wood, but they also make amulets of entire places, etching seals above the tombs of the honored dead. At the height of their power, the amulets of the Ma Kep spread Sekhem across the entire nameless empire. The Mesen Nebu. The journey of the alchemist is to transmute the base into the sublime and transcendent. With sufficient applications of Sekhem and will, one element can be transmuted into another. The Mesen Nebu were the first to master bronze, to locate gold in the earth, and to command the slave to dig it from the ground. The alchemists are the founders of magic, for they comprehended the sacred nature of substances, the simplest of which is the change of lead to gold. Wealth may be a byproduct of the alchemist art, but it is not the point. Rather, the point is how the alchemist chooses to manifest their essence. Commerce is just a kind of alchemy, transmuting goods into wealth and power, to convert them then into even greater assets. Those who are born of gold see how one thing may be changed into another. The Shaniatu taught the craftsmen of Irem the rudiments of matter. The Mesin Nebu refined their teaching to give the nameless empire mastery over bronze, jewel craft, and mining. The Mesin Nebu then named the essential substance of their art Dedwin, or prosperity, or utility. Utilizing blades of bronze and Dedwin, the nameless empire cut down all in their path, pushing their borders beyond the light of dawn and sunset. Apart from the tools of war, the alchemists crafted tools to build monuments worthy of Irem. They could even turn the flesh of slaves into gold and their bones into lapis. Anyone could join the alchemists if they demonstrated intelligence, talent, and tenacity. Indeed, effort counts as much as ability. In eternal life, the deathless cannot reproduce, so a certain level of egalitarianism is necessary, so they recruit from talented drug cookers as often as bankers. But the Mesin Nebu have always had an insatiable appetite for gold, silver, bronze, and all things beautiful. True, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but those who are born of gold see beauty in not only the product, but the process. After all, they are alchemists. The alchemists hunt dead when on the judge's behalf, so that they may return to Duat and build palaces of their own. Despite what misguided believers of the mountain god might say, money is neither the root nor the flower of all evil. Wealth in life may be channeled into wealth in death, converted into prosperity in the afterlife. An alchemist may do such things by transmutation, entombing, and destruction of the beautiful, both things and people. Alchemy is itself the study of nature, even shaped Hammered, melted, gold is always gold. But those born of gold test themselves by seeking to mutate the immutable. The Mesin Nebu seek transformation both mundane and mystical. They revere the judges because they are ostensibly masters of the art, 
having created the right of return and the endless opportunity for transformation and glory. Those more advanced in the art ponder how the Shaniatu learned of Dedwin and alchemy, and if there is a deeper understanding of the art. Since alchemy requires a certain level of effort and the deathless have a finite amount of secum, the Mesin Nebu are very economical about how they use their resources. They are always weighing the cost and benefits of any enterprise as it is going on, but never risk what is essential to them. The Mesin Nebu view apotheosis through the same lens. They already live forever, master sorcery unattainable to mortals, and lord over cults that transcend civilizations. Of what value then is apotheosis? Is death really that much of a relief from eternity? Even though the return entails a certain amount of pain, it is a known quantity. Ultimately, apotheosis is a series of vague promises that offends both the alchemist's sense of mastery over their own fates and the will of the judges of Duat. The Sesha Hebsu from the City of Pillars, the Nameless Empire ruled much of the ancient world of prehistory. There was no greater innovator of Iron than the Scribe, the ancient predecessor of the Bureaucrat. The Scribe served to keep the various records that every empire needs to function, tax assessors, archivists, notaries, treasurers, copyists, and others. The Sesha Hepsu were separated from the other guilds by the power they placed on the written word. The sorcerer priests were proud, and some might say vain, but they knew that they needed able administrators to manage the many limbs of empire, a neutral record keeper between the fractious and feuding guilds, priests, and nobles. The Sesha Hepsu speak of the existence of the Scroll of Ages, a phrase that contains the entire religious structure of the nameless empire, and yet is distinct from it. The scribes argue over the exact meaning of the scroll, whether it serves as the embodiment of a deity of the scribes to the god, or an abstract of all of the universe's knowledge. The scroll both drives the closed books and gives them their authority. Every offense against the nameless empire, and especially its pharaoh, was overseen by the priests of Duat, its senate, and was recorded. The Sesha Hepsu were given authority over minor criminals in civil disputes. Those that involved the sorcerer priest were heard by the guild masters of the closed books. Irem often convened tribunals of scribes, as the most learned members of the empire, to oversee disputes. They heard testimony, interrogated witnesses, examined evidence, much like our own courts today. The guild master of the scribes, or even the pharaoh, sat as judge of final appeal, but mostly, the tribunal of scribes' judgment was final and binding on all parties. The closed books are attentive to every detail, regardless of hardship or interest. They were also the masters of letters, which involved not only the learning of language, but of sound interpretation and judgment of language. Like the Tef Abi and the Mesin Nebu, the Sesha Hepsu were no respecters of persons. Talent determined one's rise in the guild. Some scribes were even known to expel their own children if they were unable to meet the guild's high standards. Indeed. Anyone could leave their guild to join another, but precious few chose to become Sesha Hepsu due to their high standards. Some of the scribes frequently expelled members who acted with impermissible bias or lack of discretion. Others even chose to leave the guild in the face of a loss of status among the scribes. The closed books, like the Roman Janus, wear two faces, judge and scrivener. Regardless of what other guilds believe, the scribes have a level of authority over them, whether as inquisitors or as adjudicators. Likewise, the scribes regard magic as the product of two elements, the will and the word. To their chagrin, the Sesha Hepsu consider themselves linked to the deceived, the scribes as masters of the word, and the Shuangsen as masters of will. The Sesha Hepsu remember the deceived and recall that word and will are inextricably linked. Some scribes think this makes them uniquely suited to combat the Shuangsen. Unlike the Su Minet, the shepherds of the chamber, the Sesha Hepsu are not inflexible. The shape of words may change, but not their substance. Everyone needs their records kept, whether it is financial records, legal records, occult records, organizational records, etc. 
The Sesha Hebzu chronicle the passage of time, which allows them to better traverse time and geography. Others are a bit more active and see it as their duty to balance the scales of Maat with their own hands, choosing to both make history and record it. But the role of the scribe is not only to record, but to intuit meaning to certain acts and questions. The Sesha Hepsu seek to grow into the roles they find themselves in, whether it is historian, archivist, notary, what have you. But those closed books who fix their eyes on apotheosis are the most fervent seekers in this world and the next. Because the scribes deal in the written word, their skill with text and name magic is second to none. After all, words are power, and the power of the true names of things is the oldest and most powerful of all magics. Word and will. Without the word, no other magic can function, not the sacred geometries of the Tef Abi, the funerary rites of the Su Minet, or the alchemy of the Messin Nebu. The Su Minet. Egypt inherited its fixation on life after death from the nameless empire, because Irem knew that one's place in the afterlife was determined by not only one's station in this life, but the preparation taken prior to death. The Shaniatu created the rite of return. Their apprentices, the Su Minent, did the work of preparing the dead for their journey into the next world. The death priests mastered Irem's darkest magic. They were willing to assist in the sorcerer priest's bloodiest and cruelest experiments to ensure that the great of Irem would enjoy eternity. This meant that the members of the Shepherds of the Chamber were some of the strongest willed of the guilds and the ones who could be relied upon to keep their sanity in the face of the monstrous and the inhuman. Irem was meant to last forever. Everyone in the City of Pillars in the Nameless Empire wished to carry their lifetime of labors into the afterlife with them. The earliest priests who peered between the worlds of the living and the dead noticed that those ancestors who were revered, prayed for, and sent into the ground with relics and offerings, and whose bodies had been attended to, were more powerful in death. These predecessors of the Shaniatu were quick to conceal this fact from the masses, and bound those priests who were aware of it into service to them. The sorcerer priests and their apprentices refined their ability to prepare bodies for burial, to encase the energies of life within the mortal shell, so that true life could later be restored. But the Su Minent delved deeper than even the Shaniatu might have liked, giving birth to abominations in their secret laboratories and chambers. But the more ears that hear a secret, the harder it is to keep. It was a lowly slave who heard the Shaniatu speak the words of the rite to some of the Su Minent. The slave, horrified by what he had heard, spread the appalling rumor to his fellows, giving birth to a crude, sacrilegious magic, the Klyphoth. The Shaniatu did their best to suppress this aberration, but it was already too late. But the Su Minent made good use of the people's fear of death to make themselves and their services indispensable to Irem. From their clients, they extracted considerable sums to ensure that the honored dead would have a place of honor in the afterlife. From their supplicants, they took oaths of celibacy and obedience to keep their order free from the politics of lineage and filial piety. A shepherd's initiation into the mysteries began in childhood. All aspirants were trained and quizzed in herbology, sacred geometry, medicine, and theology. Theirs was a dangerous profession. The dead misliked being trifled with, and the preparation of a shell opened the preparer to powers that could tear a soul to pieces. In the modern world, the death priests have adjusted to observation and practice of death, ranging from murderers for hire to morticians. Their art is subtle, but their faith in the judges of Duat remains unbroken. After all, a shell must be emptied before it can be filled again. The arts of the Sumanet take them into the realm of the gods, given their command of the forces of life and death. These powers take their toll on their wielder's sanity and body. They are tied to the will of the judges because they know that deviation opens them to the forces of chaos and prevents them from personal weakness and failure. The nameless empire is lost to time, which means that the Su Minent cling even tighter to tradition and the will of the judges. Their rigorous adherence to tradition is their hatred and fear of the Su Anxen, who were so driven to express their own will that they brought the nameless empire to its knees 
and banished it into darkness. Of all the guilds, the Sumanent have not forgotten the deceived, and their wrath against them is especially fierce. The shepherds of the chamber are the least moved by modernity. Times may change, but the dead are as they have always been since the earliest days. They need remembrance, ritual, and sustenance. The shepherds find comfort in this sameness, in an inalterable faith that transcends any mere mortal attachment or sense of self. To be one of the Sumanent is an eternal duty. The greater a shepherd's standing in the guild, the greater their responsibilities as one of the priests of the dead. The uninitiated are set to dangerous menial tasks because the death priests do not open their ranks easily to anyone. The shell, the body, the cot is impermanent. Left to its own devices, it rots, then crumbles into dust as if it never was. Mummification is the answer to this impermanence. With the Sumanent, these preparations are further complicated by the time, place, and manner of the dead's transition. The height of the shepherd's craft is to hold the body in the same state as it was when the soul departed it. The shepherds regard apotheosis as something between a heresy against the judges of Duat and a curiosity that merits some investigation in their off time. After all, the rite of return is sacred, and to attempt to unlock its mysteries constitutes a rebellion against the gods and their priests. But on the other hand, if there is greater insight to be gained from the gods' will by studying the rite, then perhaps they have a duty to comprehend it more deeply. The Sumanent focus on Uter, the focusing of life energy into a prepared vessel gives the shepherds the ability to craft wonders and monstrosities. Sekum does not care what it is infused to, a convicted killer whose arms and legs have been amputated and replaced with weapons of bone, or the eye of a holy man prepared to see all that is hidden. Sekum, like rivers and tributaries, is only concerned with its continuous flows, not in the directions or configurations it is shaped to travel in. The Tef Abi. Regardless of what the so-called dragons of Atlantis claim, there are only two absolute laws of magic. The first law is that magic, like any other element, water, air, earth, or flame, has its own movement. With the correct knowledge and tools, it can be directed and shaped, which is the foundation of sorcery. The second law of magic is that sympathy is the most powerful of all sorceries. A part of a thing, or an image of a thing, is not merely a representation. To those who see the flow of magic, an effigy is the thing itself. The Nameless Empire and its Egyptian successors believed in the power of sympathetic magic. The Egyptians buried their dead with effigies, which were meant to serve as substitute bodies for the dead, should their own be lost or made unusable. Humans marvel at the great works of the ancient world temples, palaces, tombs, and statues. But these things do not simply come into being. Great works require great vision and greater ability. A slab of marble is just a slab of marble until the master artisan applies his own skill and vision to what was once just a lump of stone. Some artists go so far as to consider their works to be like their own children. And this is the philosophy of the Tef Abi, the father of idols. The Tef Abi are the youngest of guilds according to them, a tale they are proud of as they consider the other guilds to be mere prototypes, imperfect precursors to themselves. The Shaniatu assembled the greatest of the other guilds and commanded them to refine every aspect of their civilization. So they did. Instead of infusing objects with power, they built temples and districts for the purpose of directing the flow of Sekhem. They took language and developed complex planning and higher mathematics. They took the rudiments of the occult and developed sacred geometries. They took the world's first nation and created the world's first empire. Everything we think of when we refer to ancient Egypt came from the minds of the Tef Abi, that and much more. They were the planners and architects of the great tombs that the mummies use to this very day, and nearly every Tef Abi has a tomb of their own. The Tef Abi's tombs, temples, and monuments had two purposes. To build the nation of Irem and to control the world's magic. Of all of the guilds, the Tef Abi are a true meritocracy. Rank and birth mean nothing to the father of idols. 
just one more reason that the other guilds regard them with suspicion. The Tefaabi regard form and function as being two sides of the same coin. However, if one failed to join the Tefaabi after the first time, there would be no second chance. If a person could not demonstrate that they are adaptable, then anything after would be useless. The reason for this harshness is that the Tefaabi believe that all magic comes from the caster. Effigies, Sekum, Hekau do not create magic, any more than a stack of lumber is a house or a shrine. It is the carpenter and the sculptor who give shape and purpose to the raw substance of the world. It is why they are so driven to create works that are not only practical, but elegant. Another criterion that the Tef Abi judge their creations by is longevity. That which is useful and worthwhile must be made to last. That which is feeble or useless passes into oblivion, as it rightly should. Just as stone is superior to wood, and the gods are superior to the deathless, and both are superior to mortals. The father of idols have a preference for stone to create their works, whether great or small, though they are not restricted to this medium. Indeed, the Tefaabi do restrain themselves from any art or discovery or technology. However, they are not flighty or fashionable. They proceed carefully into new techniques, and when they are certain of their mastery, present their findings to their peers. Indeed, they find the modern world to be devoid of substance, a hollow, pretty facade, made with useful tools but producing nothing of true value. The Tefaabi do not consider apotheosis much, but when they do, they consider it to be either a goal worthy of all of their talents and attention, or a path fallen to ruin which they have too little information to follow without losing what they have now. As might be expected of the mummies who follow the father of idols, the Tefaabi favor effigies. When crafted properly, regardless of the material used, effigies are built to last. Because effigies rely on sympathetic magic, they may produce a lesser effect when used against a target they were not created to be used against. And those were the guilds of Mummy the Curse. The Arisen are a definite change from the Undying in both tone and goal. The Arisen are much darker in character, and essentially serve as amnesiac superweapons marshaled by the judges of Duat and their respective cults. It's also a change in that the Curse Mummies are more powerful when they are newly awakened, but weaken the longer they are active, as compared to, well, Pretty much anything else in the world of darkness that gets more powerful the more active and aged they are. The lore of Mummy the Curse is scant but interesting, especially concerning figures like the Heretic, the Judges of Duat, and the Deceived. Anyway, that's all I have for now. Until next time.